this is going to be try to be very informal, as informal as possible. I'm a musician. Um, I'm a classical clarinetist. And when I got out of um, school at the University of Southern California, uh, I had a degree that said that I could perform the clarinet in any circumstance except for jazz. Now, um, uh, from there, I've had this very strange journey into uh, grant writing and understanding fiscal, um, fiscal uh, accounting and budgets, etc and uh, have been doing it for about 25 years. So I'm telling you that because I'm trying to prove to you that if a clarinetist can write grants successfully um, and learn to do this work, then absolutely anyone can learn to do this work. Do you agree? <laughs> you must agree with me, otherwise um, we're in trouble. So um, I wanted to go over the agenda. We're going to go to the grants website that's located on the home page at, um, in the library's home page, and I'll show you how to get to that. Um, then my, um, my student assistant, Suchi, is going to share with you how she was able to find uh, the resources that we're going to be using today uh, to go over. Uh, I want to talk to you about creating your checklists. And then we're going to review these five uh, opportunities. And you will be able to also see where all the other, we cannot take any more students. I'm sorry, the, the, the workshop is full and we now have a fire hazard. So is my student here from grad school? Could you please come back at two o'clock and we'll repeat the same workshop with the same presenters, okay? Yes. Can I ask a question real quick? Because I had asked this over there. Is this for people seeking international grants or for international students? International students. So it okay, they had said it went both ways. No. So this I'll, is just for international I'll students. Thank you. We <coughs> have a seat here in the front row if you like. Thank you very much. Um, and then we have a guest presenter today also. We have two student presenters. Um, Moksen Ali, and he's going to go over the Fulbright. Um, because he's an award-winning um, uh, applicant, and he's going to go over that, and then hopefully we have time for questions. So I also don't have a watch, so if anyone wants to uh, contribute a watch that I can look at while we're doing this so I can stay on task, or just tell me what time it is when I ask you. Yes. Oh, I've got a time. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so let's go to the website. This is the home page at the libraries. You click here, using the libraries. Please um, take notes on this because it's very hard to find it otherwise. You click on using the libraries and you click here on grant resources. Now, we're, this is the grant resources page for the libraries that I created, and also now Suchi uh, Yelampankula is, she's uh, managing it for me. We are going to go to this first, uh, to this first link, but over on the left side, um, this is just a repetition link of the page that you're on. This one, Grants Tracking Database, you need a login, and that's really not applicable to you. <coughs> this, um, this page here, Past Awards, is a very important page because on this page you will find all of the grants that the libraries have collected and submitted and you can see their award and the funding agency so you can look at examples of funded applications. All of these are live links, they take you right to the proposal. So we're, we're trying to show you that we're transparent and we're trying to help the students here, and this is really open to anyone. It has global access. I'm going to come back to, to share. We have one student who is an award-winning NSF um, fellowship winner for pre-doctoral fellowship. She has contributed the first application by a student to the uh, institutional repository here at UF, and that we can show you her proposal. Um, 
and it's open to anyone. She's the first one, her name is Christy Galt, and we're hoping that in the future, more students who win proposals, have winning proposals or get awarded, will also share their proposals with us electronically so we can show them to the world here on our site. So that the benefits that you get from reading her proposal, others will also benefit from reading if you want to share your proposal with others. Okay. When um, Dr. Levy was talking about the workshops and the resources that are available, these are the workshops that we have presented to date here at the libraries to help students <coughs> with writing grants. And uh, some of them are for librarians. This one, first one is for librarians. <coughs> this one is for people working in museums. And then these are for students who are seeking grants in from NSF. Um, this is another one from NSF. This is for library. And this is a, a very interesting uh, video that shows how the NIH works in its review process. Uh, National Institutes of Health. We're also going to post the videos from today on the site. So you'll be able to come back and look at all of the videos, all of the sessions from this site. And we're also hoping to put the Fulbright, there was a Fulbright workshop um, for US students mostly, and that we're going to put here too. So this is not relevant articles, these are very, excellent articles that are written to help students uh, write better proposals and especially this one because it gives a table here that gives you the difference between writing a grant and writing an academic paper. So I would strongly recommend that you look at this one, why academics have a hard time writing good grant proposals. Nobody's smiling. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is supposed to be fun. You're getting all this information and you didn't pay anything. Um, so then we come down here to important links. This is the page that we're going to go over today. <coughs> that has been created for you, beginning here, funding for international undergraduate, graduate, PhD, and postdoc. And these are all of the live links. So just going back so you make sure you know how to get to that. Here, let me go back. You click here, funding grants, <coughs> uh, fellowship grants, student scholars, or on the, on the home page for the um, grants management page, you click here, fellowship grants, student scholars. Everyone understand that? Yes? Good. Um, <coughs> these are also all these other resources that are available to you to search for grant proposals. The community of science is important to you that you know that. Um, you can search for grant opportunities. You can also search for grant opportunities in IRIS. But this is the one that Suchi is going to show you today, International Education Financial Aid is a database for international students. And she's going to show you a little bit about that. Also, Indiana University Grad Grant Center, it's a very important um, site. They're giving us permission to link it here so you can see what they're doing. And then there's some other resources here um, that you might want to look at at another time. So let's go here. We are right on time. Um, I want to say a couple of things. There's something really magical about grant writing. It's kind of like going to the movies. So you are creating something on paper that doesn't exist, correct? It's ideas that don't exist. They only exist in your mind, correct? You also have your own personal experiences. Those are your personal stories, your personal history, right? That's unique also, correct? So, the, so when the reviewer is, is reviewing or reading about you and your ideas, that's a unique experience for that reader, correct? No one else is going to have anything like you, what you are presenting in your application, correct? 
it has to be a movie. Meaning, the reader has to feel like they went to watch a movie about your life and about your goals and about what you want to do in this universe here, correct? And if there are big blank spots in the movie, the reader is not going to want to watch. Not want to, not, the reader is not going to want to read the proposal, correct? Because it's too much work. So they're working to make the mental movie from your paper from your, it's usually online now, so if they're reading it online or if they printed out your proposal. That's a very difficult thing to do for a reviewer. So you have to understand that um, what you're putting down is really the story of your life and your future life in uh, academia and in research. And it should be congruent. It should be without gaps so that the person reading really understands it. Otherwise, they're going to say, I'm going to read this one later because it's too much work. Correct? Okay. There are six things that you need to remember when you are writing proposals. And when you're looking for proposals. Because right now, we're going to show you the ones that we found that are applicable to some of you. We are not going to show you today opportunities that are applicable to all of you. Does that make sense? Because you are a heterogeneous group. You all have different situations, different disciplines. You come from different countries. Okay? So, and, and uh, we're not going to be able to meet everyone's needs here. I want to make sure that your expectations are that I cannot solve all of your future life problems. Okay? Your money problems. Um, I can help you to learn something that you probably don't know. And that you will be able to apply what, what you don't know in some future time. So it, whether it's applicable to you is, is a, a question, but it might be applicable to someone that you meet that you will be able to help that person and say, hey, you should do this, or you might want to go here because you would be eligible for this, although I'm not. Number one is eligibility. You must look at any opportunity. The, the first thing you want to look at is are you eligible? Do, that means the level of education that you're in, right? So what level are you in? And are you a master's student? Are you starting your postdoc? Are you a pre-doc? Are you starting your dissertation? So that's one. You have to know, see the requirement. Does it require? <coughs> The, the, is the applicant required to be a U.S. citizen? That's very important to see right away. Um, where, where does the applicant have to live or reside? So the eligibility requirements are the first thing you want to find when you're searching. The second thing you want to find is the deadline. Okay? If the deadline has passed, most of these funders and sponsors, funders, sponsors, the same thing. Agencies, the same thing. Um, they have closed their application, so we cannot even show you the application because it's not within the deadline, period. So the deadline has closed, so some of them you have to go back at a later time and see when the deadline is. The new deadline is usually one year from the deadline that you see. So if it says um, applications are closed, because the deadline was April 1st, 2010. You have to come back before April 1st, 2011, and you will see the application is available. Does that make sense? So it's usually one year from the expiration date that you can apply again, and that the application would be visible. The third thing is the grant period. The grant period, the definition of a grant period is when does the money start? When does the project start? And when does the project end? Correct? So you need to find out what is the grant period for this deadline cycle. The fourth thing you need to look at is what is the funding amount? Because each one of the things we're talking about today has a different funding amount. And some of those amounts are based on the country in which you're coming from. 
So I can't even tell you what the amount is. But usually it's to cover your tuition or part of your tuition, uh, usually part of your expenses for living, and usually part of your travel to go uh, back and forth to your home country. The fifth thing you want to look at are the requirements for filling out the application. What are the required components of filling out the application? So you can see what you don't have. And the final thing you need to, to look for is the, uh, is the criteria. The criteria by which you will be judged if you make an application. Many people don't look for the criteria, so they have no idea what does the funder or the sponsor want to invest in. So you prepare your proposal, follow the directions, but you ignore the criteria. Many of these do not give the criteria, but if they give the criteria, you must pay attention and you must answer the questions so that you have high scores in your criteria for evaluation. Does that make sense? Okay? All right. So, Suchi, before we go through these, can you come up here and show them um, how you were able to search the site? Good luck finding finding the link there. So I should give a proper introduction to Suchi. Um, she is from India, from a town Vizag in Vizag yes. in India, and um, she is in the master's program for computer engineering. And she's my graduate student. So, um, if you go to the homepage of our uh, funding site, you will see there are many resources we have uploaded here for uh, hunting for grants. So, when I was trying to compile a list, uh, standard, of course, I always begin with Google. But uh, there are some really nice databases online, for, especially for international students. And uh, one of them is this one, IEFA, International Education Financial Aid. So this is the website. Now this one uh, we found to be the most comprehensive. Most of them have got very few records. This one has got over 2,000. And it covers almost all disciplines in all countries, almost. So this is a really good resource. Uh, it's very easy to, it's pretty straightforward because you can look at the <coughs> award type, you can awards, fellowships, grants, internships, whatever you're looking for. Locations here refers to the location where you want to study. So you can look for, since we are in the US right now, you can look for something in the United <coughs> States, or you can look for something everywhere. You've got fields of study, pretty much everything. So so if I click on one of these, this gives you a summary. Now this database is very good because it has a large number of records, but I would recommend don't go, uh, don't rely 100% on this. This has like an 80% accuracy. Most databases, when they upload information, they don't go totally into the depths of it. They don't do 100% research. So uh, go right to the link which takes you to the main site to do research. So the name usually is pretty accurate. Money is usually accurate. The rest of it don't rely 100%. So this is a free registration, so you can just uh, create a login and log on. For now, I'm going to use the one I've created. <coughs> so when you click on that, it gives you the contact information. You can go there. Many of these links are broken also. Uh, not many, I'd say few of them. So you have to maybe type them out again. But. Now the problem with hunting for um, resources for international students, most of these websites, they are not very comprehensive. They have very little information. You have to really put in a lot of effort. You have to have patience to really hunt and you have to be willing to put in the time. But once you do that, you will find a lot of resources online. 
So this is for Asian students in Mumbai. fellowships and so on. So this is pretty straightforward, but um, so this is the only thing I would recommend. Yes, put in a lot of effort, patience, but you will get good results on this. So best will now go through some of the results which we found, which are we hope applicable. <coughs> so, <coughs> so basically, when you're going to these sites that Suchi just shared with you, you're going to look for those six things that I just told you. Eligibility, deadline, grant period, funding amount, requirements, and criteria. Sometimes you're going to find all six. You'll be very lucky and very happy. But sometimes you only find a few of those. The other important thing you're looking for under requirements is the actual application, right? So uh, if the first thing you look for is the application, that's okay. But you you cannot know how to do this work unless you see the application, correct? Many times that will be buried, okay? So you'll see the problems that we had um, when we go through this. So I'm just bringing you back to the page that we created for the fellowships. And here we're looking at um, the Ford program. So this is number 15 in our list, and this is what it funds. So you see here, award amount varies. It varies by country of origin, okay? Um, the country in which is your national origin. And it also, and the deadline also is uh, different based on the country of origin. So these are the areas, asset building and community development. They have four subcategories, knowledge, creativity, and freedom, peace and social justice. And then you come here and you come to their website. So if you see in here that none of this makes connects with you, then you don't need to go to the website. But if you see that something here is of interest to you and you want to learn more, then you come here and you go to the site. And you get this. Now, what I'm, what I'm looking for is one of the six things, right? I'm looking for eligibility, deadline, grant period, funding amount, requirements, which includes the application and the criteria. So none of this gives it to me but I see this map, and um, we're going to pick Nigeria. We're picking Nigeria because there is an English application still available for Nigeria. Other countries are in a foreign language that I don't want to use right now, even though we could do Spanish, because I speak Spanish, but um, in the other countries, the application is closed, so you cannot see the application. Does that make sense? So Nigeria still has an open application process. Each of the countries has a totally different look to their website. They're all individually managed by that country. So here's Nigeria. It explains um, the type of people that they're looking for. Fellowships will be awarded to applicants from diverse backgrounds, including social groups and communities that lack systemic access to higher education. So we come here and look, we have eligibility requirements. You must be a resident or resident nationals of Nigeria, Ghana, and Senegal. Hold <coughs> bachelor's degree. So here, this is, uh, this is good. Now we can see right away what the eligibility is. And here are the eligible fields for Nigeria. And then if you don't have access to a computer and you need a hard copy of the application, you can go to one of these locations and they will give you a hard copy of the application. Because in this country, obviously, um, computers, access to computers is not such an easy thing. So we go up here and we go to application. 
Referee forms here are those forms for those who will be judging. So application form is here. Here's the write-up for international fellowship programs. Take a minute to read this. Okay. So here we have the general guidelines. Requirements and guidelines are the same thing. Okay? So the word requirement and the re word guidelines, they're the same thing. So it's good that we have the guidelines here. And again, we have the eligibility and the application process. And here's an example of the application. So most of the applications for fellowships for students look very similar to the application that you prepared to get into UF. Does that make sense? So you had to write an essay, you had to give all your data about your test scores, you had to give information about your, uh, where you live, et cetera, right? So this application is very similar to that. So here you have basic information checklist. Um, this is what all of the things that they're going to ask you to um, submit. I'm just going to let you look at one, and then we'll go to another one. Personal information, if you're married, family information, your background, your degrees, and, and what I want to get to are the, question, the essay questions, because you're really going to be judged on your essays, right? Here you go. This is a question about your community service, and they want <coughs> very specific information. But you only have this, there's usually a, a, a tight space in which you have to fit your characters. So you cannot submit 100 pages about to answer one question. You must abide by the rules that the application entails. So if there is a character limit, um, or page limit, then abide by that and do not exceed. Leadership, activities and awards, publications, and your personal history. What's your academic plan? Now, this is really important. A lot of proposals that I have read have the poorest title. They want, so in this case, they're asking you for the name, a title, of the research work that you're going to be doing or the academic work that you're going to be doing. Spend a lot of time on the title because if the title grabs the reader, is interesting, it looks like, oh, they spent some time on this title. It makes, it's a great title. I can understand their project simply by reading the title, right? Most people spend the least amount of time on the title. Um, and then you have your objectives, relevance, justification, why are you doing this project, what is important about this project to society, to your home country, to your personal work, um, methods, how are you going to carry it out, and expected outcomes. All of this should be very precise and very detailed. Now, some people say, how can I write about the future outcomes of my work when I don't know what's going to happen? And what if my outcomes change? It's okay, it doesn't matter. If your outcomes change, that's not a problem. You should have in mind what you believe will be your outcomes. For instance, everyone has a life, things change, right? It could be that your outcomes change completely, and that's fine. You don't have to uh, produce what you're saying you're going to produce in your outcomes. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, so don't feel like you cannot predict the future. Just write something that makes sense and that others can understand and um, you'll be evaluated on this, not your future work. Okay? And then your letters of reference. This is another key problem that we have with fellowship. 
um, applications. The people that are chosen to write these letters might not have any experience writing a referral letter for a student for a fellowship, and they don't know what to write. So sometimes it's good to prepare some questions for them in advance, just to make sure they write a very strong letter for you. For instance, you can come, you can say um, to them, uh, invite them, ask them, will you be one of my reference letters? And if they say yes, you can say, would it be okay with you if I give you some questions that I would like you to answer in the letter? So it could be that um, you want them to refer to something specific in the research that you've been doing. They might not remember if you put a question there that reminds them that they will answer that question in their own words for you. Does that make sense? You have more control over the quality of these letters if you prepare some questions for the, the um, referral, uh, the person writing your referral to answer. But if they say, no, I'm good, I can write the letter, no problem, you, um, then that's fine but you can offer to, to provide them with some specific questions that you would like them to address in the letter. Any questions about that? I see some confusing people. No? How could they, how could they write those questions? I'm sorry? How do I know their questions? No, you would prepare questions that you would want the, the um, person giving you the reference to write about. So, for instance, you could say, um, um, what, um, what were the successes that I had in my specific research project? And you can put the name of your research project there. So you're helping them remember you. If a, a professor usually has 100 students or many students, how are they going to be able to remember what they should write about you? But if you give them some questions, they have a container. The mind works uh, in terms of grant proposals. The best thing to do is to remember that the question is the container for the information. If you have a poor question, you have a poor container, and you will have a very poor answer. So the better the container, the better the question, the better the information will be that is written in the answer. Okay. So this is a sample of uh, one of these applications. Is that helpful to you to see one? Is this the first time you're seeing an application? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if this is the first time. Good. Okay, so we have different levels in this room, so you need to understand that and, um, and be okay with that. So now I'm going to close this one. Close this one. We're going to skip Fulbright because we have a guest presenter who's going to talk about that. Let's go to organization. This, uh, the name of this agency is Organization of America States, OAS. Um, again, some of these are specific to the country of origin or the citizen of that country. And then you can read this uh, little description. Okay, so let's go to this site. Now, here's the deadlines. Well, here's the academic cycle for 2011-2012. This is called the grant period, right? That starts <coughs> January 2011 <coughs> to March 2012. They are very kind and they give you the eligibility requirements right there so you can see them. You, uh, many of these have requirements of GRE or GMAT or uh, TOEFL. Hopefully you have those or you should take them. Important information on academic scholarships. So this gives you more information about what they fund. Approximately 60% of the expenses are covered by OAS for studies. And then you come here. Applicants must submit their completed application and documents to their international liaison. So you have to have um, a liaison from your country. So for graduate students, application procedures. 
another word for guidelines, another word for requirements. Okay, blank application form. Here we go, here's another one. I'm going to quickly scroll through this. These are the countries from which you can come because this is for the Americas. So are there people in this room that are from these countries? Okay, good. <coughs> Here are some more. Permanent residence in addition to H above if applicable. So if you're a permanent resident of these countries. <coughs> Your language and these are the um, these are the categories the disciplines for which they fund so this program is also different in that there's two ways that you can apply. You can apply and and um, they will help, if you're a winner, they will help you get admission into a university um, uh, that, um, so they act as your uh, emissary or consultant on your behalf to match you with the university. Or you can choose your university and do it yourself. So this is a very unusual, um, uh, proposal in, in that it does that. So here are your tests and here's the other option. Financing for self-paced scholarships is more limited than for OAS place scholarships, which means that if OAS place you, places you, you have more a better chance of getting the award. And if you choose to do this self-paced scholarship, it means that then you would be making, deciding on the university and how you're going to structure your education. So that's the difference. I'm looking for the question, the narrative questions. Your publications. Are you currently, or have you ever been? Okay, so more form. Here you go. Please write an analytical essay indicating how your area of study will contribute to the development needs of your country. Most of these applications expect you to go get an education, finish your education, and come back and contribute to your national country, your, your nationality. Does that make sense? Um, here's the second one. It requires recipients to return to the sponsoring country for two years upon completion. So they want to see a five-year plan of how you're going to apply your knowledge. And you would do that year one, year two, year three, year four, separate it out and indicate what you plan to do. Again, this is only a plan. If you don't do what's in here, it's still okay. Life is going to change and you're going to have changes, but you're predicting now, in the future, I plan to do this. If it doesn't happen exactly the way you put it, that's okay. You communicate to the program officer, your liaison, and you say, I have some changes in my plan, and you get approval to change your plan. But some people have such a hard time understanding that they cannot predict the future, and therefore they can't answer this question. The more detail that you give, then they can see exactly what you have in mind and how creative you are and how committed you are. So those are basically the two questions. And then um, that's it. You have these other requirements. So, and then you submit online. So it's all about knowing what you want to do in the future and how you're going to contribute to your country and what you've done in the past that makes you a good investment to the sponsor or to the agency or to the funder. Does that make sense? Okay. I am, I'm out of time, but I want to do this one thing. <coughs> I want to go to here. <coughs> 
how do I get to, let's go back, using the libraries, grant resources, going to past awards, and I'm going to Christy Galt's application. Here it is. It's a little bit hard to read. So what I would like to do is have everyone close your eyes. I'm going to share something with you, and I'm going to prove to you that the movie idea of the movie works. Okay? Close your eyes, everyone. I'm going to read to you the first paragraph of this person's application. Really, seriously. Do this with me. Close your eyes, please. Okay. The midday sun beat down on my classmates and I as we hiked to this uh, secluded bog for our wetland ecology field trip during my junior year of college. Branches scraped our faces while we navigated the dense thicket that surrounded the bog. A, dis uh, a disturbed nest of bees sent us running, but the swamp ground hindered our, wa uh, our wader-clad feet with every step. The smell of sulfur and rotting vegetation greeted us when we finally arrived at the bog. For two hours, we analyzed the soil and vegetation while walking ankle deep in a carpet of waterlogged moss, and I loved every moment. That wetland was the most beautiful and unique habitat I had ever seen. During the field trip, I snacked on wild berries, blueberries, and cranberries while walking over the buoyant ground that felt like a waterbed. It was fascinated, I was fascinated by plants I had never seen before, such as the delicate yellow and purple pitcher plants. The experience taught me the value of wild ecosystems and motivated me to conduct research aimed at reducing the environmental impacts of agriculture. In my research, I also want to improve economic and gender inequalities either in my own institution or internationally. As a result, I plan to pursue a career in agricultural biotechnology because progress in this field benefits the environment and society. Okay, open your eyes. You understand what this person is about, right? You totally see the movie about what this person has experienced and why they want to do the work that they're doing. It's only in the first paragraph of their personal statement. So that's the that's what the reader is doing. They're saying, now I want to read the rest of this because this was very interesting to me. And um, and she personalized it and made it very specific and it wasn't boring. Okay. So now I want to um, let me get to this one. Moksen Ali is a PhD candidate in Computer and Information Sciences and Engineering. And he is a winner of a Fulbright Award. Um, and his home city is Lahore, Pakistan. So here you go. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm not going to keep you for a long time because uh, at 11, Pakistan and Australia are fighting for semi-final. I want to see the first match. I want to see. It's actually, in West Indies, they are having a 2020 World Cup of Pakistan and uh, 2020 World Cup of Cricket. This variation of like baseball, something. But yeah, so let's start. Uh, to bring a little knowledge, a little more reason, and a little more compassion into world affairs, and thereby increase the chance that nations will learn at last to live in peace and friendship. Uh, William Fulbright. This Fulbright scholarship was created after World War II uh, in the name of Fulbright, Mr. Fulbright, and actually by his own legislation. Uh, there are 75,000 new grants annually given uh, to the people who actually either come from outside to the America or from US go outside to the other countries. I see some of the faces actually uh, who are already grads, grad students. So I don't think so. Okay, how many of you are starting your PhDs, or how many of you are going to start your PhDs? Okay. Uh, so right now, I'm, I'm going to discuss uh, Fulbright scholarship that is about <coughs> PhD and uh, grad studies, like masters and grad studies. But they do have a two other options. 
Humphrey. Humphrey is like mid academic. So you are, your if your some friend is working back home, and he's like, uh, he's teaching or studying something, and he has already spent like five years in the profession, uh, he can apply for that Humphrey scholarship, and they can come here and study here for one year. <clears throat> uh, they call Humphrey mid profession as uh, Fulbright scholarship. The other one is a. Uh, Grad, undergrad studies, it's like six months to one year. And anyone from your own country can apply for that. It's, uh, for six months or one year, it allows them to come here and study, continue their undergrad studies here for one semester or for one year. Fully funded, uh, they pay you for visa, they pay you for tickets, they pay your uh, medical insurance, they, pay, com they completely pay you uh, and just request just require you to go back and serve your country for two years or one year. Okay. Uh, so one of the best thing about uh, Fulbright is that they have a huge amount of alumni. Okay. So I was reading somewhere they have more uh, they have they have, they have more people who have won awards than any other any other funding program. So we already discussed they many come to the U.S. and then go there. So what they offer? Uh, right now you're going to study the we're going to see MS and doctoral studies. So who can apply non-US citizens? Uh, actually, you are already here, but many people, I've seen many people who have applied from here back their home. So you can't apply here for your scholarship. You have to apply back home for your scholarship. But I've seen few people who are already in US, and they applied for the Fulbright scholarship uh, in their own country, and they got that scholarship. Okay, And then they transferred to whatever they were doing to the Fulbright scholarship. Uh, so. Mostly they require grad students, young professional artists. Every region has a different number of scholarships. Right now, <clears throat> for example, I, he I heard that Ger Germany has a huge amount of scholarships being granted to them on the Fulbright. Pakistan also has a huge amount of scholarships being funded right now. There are other parts of there are other parts of the world which are being funded hugely uh, by by this. What Fulbright actually did, <clears throat> which benefited many, is that they created centers for everyone in every country. So, actually let's go to the rest. Uh, so for every region they have a, they have a one center that works with them. Uh, okay, let's, so right now we are looking into this thing, the Fulbright Foreign Student Program. But you can have a Fulbright Visiting Scholar Program also. You can have a Fulbright Foreign Language Teaching Assistant Program also. Okay, so Fulbright Foreign Student Program, if you go to this website, this is IIE website. Uh, <clears throat> they manage many of the scholarships being offered to the people who come from outside the US to the US. So you might want to <coughs> access them for any travel grants or for any other kind of uh, grants you, you are looking for. They are extremely helpful people. Okay, this is for much scholarship. Let's go to application information. So it gives you a participating country. So every country, they have a one, or for every region, actually they are showing for every region, for, but for every country also they have one specific center. For example, for Pakistan, uh, they have <coughs> USCFP, United States Education Fund for Pakistan. So let's go there. So if you see here, these are scholarships that I think are offered uh, to every country which is part of this program. And there are 140 countries that are part of this program. So this is master's, this is PhD, this is foreign language, and this was the undergrad program that I was talking about. And this is a Humphrey Fulbright Fellowship for Competition that is for mid profession. So, <clears throat> okay, let's uh, go to this thing. So they're looking for grad students, young professional artists. Every region has a different number of scholarships. Every, every region has a different set of <coughs> rules, but most of them are same. Uh, what rules they apply is that, okay, you have to take GRE or you don't have to take GRE, you have to take a TOEFL, you don't have to take a TOEFL, things like that. Uh, other programs are offered, they are undergrads and professional, we just have a view of you have them. Uh, you can, this, epic, this the PPT will be uploaded, so you can access these things. Uh, you can go to the IIE and to the Fulbright, and from there you can go to your regional <coughs> uh, centers. Okay. Uh, we're going to look. 
this one, I need website. Okay, whatever I'm going to talk about the presentation uh, in my presentation about how to fill this application form or how to apply this application form is my experience, uh, which I feel okay. So I so when you get scholarship, uh, you meet many people who have already received those scholarships. You talk to them, you meet them. So I get I got the feeling of what they choose, how they choose the students for the scholarship. So I will try to tell you about that, but. Uh, definitely, my experience is not a law, and that might not be, not be the thing they are looking for now. But that's what I found they, are, they were looking for when I applied. And many people I met after that, I think so I felt the same that they, these things what they were looking for. Okay. Moksan, can I interrupt? Please. We're going to post the PowerPoint on the grants workshop site where I showed you all the workshops, so you don't have to worry about taking notes. It will be there with all the live links. So you guys are already there, so I don't think so you, you require this thing. You already know that what is the benefit of coming to our US or going outside your country to study. So let's skip this thing. Uh, okay, what you mostly need is GRE. Most of you are transfer, so you have, you have already taken GRE. You need GRE, GMAT, and in most of the cases, the TOEFL. IELTS don't work here. So if, if you're taking the IELTS, uh, if you are applying for a Europe, IELTS will work, but IELTS don't, IELTS don't work here, so you have to take the TOEFL, okay? And so one of the most two important things are personal statement and the grant statement of grant purpose. Ms. Bess actually showed many things, like, which are applicable here also, like in an OAS application, similar rules apply here. Uh, but we're going to just look at them again. Three letters of references and transcripts. Uh, okay. That's Keep this in mind and let's go forward. Okay, long process. Uh, the application is a long process in this. Uh, uh, asking okay. uh, this is a long process. So you start in May and the result comes in next June. So it's, a, it's actually one year you are hanging in, like whether I will get this opportunity or whether I will not get this opportunity. So what you should be careful about this is that you should prepare yourself for anything could happen you know, in a one year and you shouldn't stall your life. You should continue either studying something or doing your job or doing internship because if if you don't get the scholarship it might it might not be a waste of time okay so so for the students one more thing uh, especially if people who come from certain regions waiting for a visa is extra headache it took me like four months to get my visa twice until when I went back and reapplied for my visa it took me four months so it takes a long time sometimes even if you got a scholarship it takes a long time to get a scholarship uh, to get a visa and finally come here and start studying. So it, you might sometimes feel that you have wasted one year or something like that, but uh, I tell you that afterwards the benefits are very good. You come to study and you're being funded by the by institution. Uh, they give you travel grants, they give you your research grants sometimes, so you are, you, are, you are here studying and you apply for, you have submitted some paper for conference and that gets accepted. You can write them a letter and they will give you a travel grant, giving you a, uh, money so you can travel to the conference, even if it's outside the country. Uh, okay, uh, now let's go forward. Okay, most of the things will look like naive, but naive, but I will, I will just go over them. So application, if you look at this application, So if you look at this application, it's a long application. Uh, most of this application are general things like name, where you lived, what kind of studies you have done, what kind of institutions you have gone, what are your records in them. This is a general purpose uh, application. But then where they get difference is future plans, where you want to apply, which institution you think you want to apply. Again, as in OS, uh, here you can actually say that you want to go here, but they have one set of office which takes your application, evaluates you according to the institution, and applies there, and even if you have not. So I, when I was coming here, I didn't knew about UF. I knew about UCF.